Hello everybody, we are here at the Warrior Exhibit in Fayetteville, Tennessee, and I'm Don Counts, and this is Linda Williams, and Linda, tell us who we have today. Don, today we have Miss Janet Ward Embry. Uh, she's not native to Fayetteville, but she lives here now, and she was served many years in the military, and we're excited to hear from you. Uh, she was in the Air Force, so. Mm -hmm. Ms. Janet, start us off here, whatever you'd like to tell us. Tell mm -hmm. us where you were born and what brought you into the military. Okay, I was born and raised in Brookhaven, Mississippi, in Lincoln County, Mississippi, <laughs> back in Lincoln County again. But I was uh, born in 1957. Um, I um, graduated high school, went to junior college, and um, I didn't see any hope of getting promoted or making it anywhere because in a small town similar to Fayetteville, I imagine, um, you know, the bad news was my father wasn't anybody and so neither was I. And <clears throat> therefore, in order to uh, get my education and continue it on, I had my associate's degree in data processing. And I worked for about a year, and I was looking at it maybe a nickel or a dime per hour raise annually, which didn't sound too great to me. And I says, you know, with the associate's degree, I, you know, they were promoting people because of who they were, not what you could do. And you were never able to prove yourself. So I uh, had a roommate in college that was an Air Force brat. And therefore, you know, that inspired me to join the military. And of course, the Air Force is the one I chose because I heard it was better, the better force of all the, you know, four services. Therefore, um, first thing I did, I went to basic training, which was in Texas. And then um, I chose, well, I went in open general, but because I had an associate's degree and my scores were fairly good, they went ahead and put me in as an air traffic controller. So I ended up uh, going down to Biloxi, Mississippi to uh, do my technical training and uh, finished up there and um, ended up, my first assignment was RAF Bentwaters. It's closed now, but it was in um, England and Felixstowe area, you know, not, it was about 80 miles from London. And uh, um, lived in the barracks, um, very unusual situation. Men outnumbered women eight to one. So I had many a choice in, um, in bows. And my husband, um, who wasn't my husband, but he introduced himself and we got involved in a play there because they were doing a play. My roommate was a uh, director. So we kind of met doing that and uh, we um, just struck up a, a real big friendship and it turned into marriage very shortly later, really. And uh, he was in the Air Force also. He was in the Air Force. He was an air traffic control radar repairman and I was an air traffic controller. So we were around each you know, each other until we got married. And once we got married, we were put on the opposite shifts, it seemed. And so we met each other going and coming. <laughs> but it was different driving on the opposite side of the road over in England. So I really had more driving experience in England than I did at home because um, very tight situation at home, tense situation, I, you know, you know, I wasn't just going to settle for anybody. They had to be somebody that I felt like I was on an even kill with that, that valued quality time like I did and not just, you know, uh, how much you have or who you know or any of those type things. But we ended up uh, serving our two years there and that's all you had as a unaccompanied tour. And we tried to get assignments together, but they sent me to Blu they were going to send me to Biloxi, no, they were going to send me to Oklahoma City and him to Biloxi, Mississippi. But I didn't understand that because I was in, I, uh, I was an air traffic controller, but they washed me out with minimum time in, and then all the guys 
got an extended six months on their training, but it wasn't their training program that, that was bad, you know, but it really was. They rewrote my training records and I thought, I'm not gonna fight to stay in a job where they don't want me. You know, I can do something else. So I went into an administrative career field and then when we got to, we ended up going to Oklahoma where my husband was gonna be deployed more than with me. And so he decided to get out. He only had 10 months left. So we bought our first house, had our first child, and um, I decided to stay in because he told me, he says, if you stay and retire, you'll never have to work again. I won't ask you to work unless you want to. So I went ahead and stayed in and um, we went, gosh, we went so many places. We went from Oklahoma, I had to go on a remote tour to Sicily where they were doing ground cruise launch missiles and they barely even got the base built before they decided, Congress decided, we're not doing ground cruise launch missiles. And therefore, they were about to shut the base down. But until they did, I uh, went on home on R&R after about seven months or so and came back pregnant. So I, <laughs> I had to take the next assignment was Eglin Air Force Base. And then I had to wait for him to graduate college in Oklahoma and uh, went on to Florida ahead of him, pregnant, doing all this traveling all over the, one of the worst flights I ever had in my life was nonstop from Oklahoma City to Frankfurt, Germany, and I was three weeks pregnant. That was after my R&R, &R. <laughs> which y'all know what happened <laughs> for the second child, plus missing my first child, who was only two, barely, not even two when I left. So my husband had to step up to the plate and be mom and dad a lot. And we traded places on that kind of thing a lot. But he got out and I stayed in. That was the only way to make it with kids because we wanted to dedicate our time. At least one of us had to be uh, unattached. So um, we traveled all over the place. Let me see, we went from let me see, after that I went to Florida, and then from Florida they chose me for an assignment to California. California, we were, um, we were major accident response backup. It was nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare training. And um, one of the neat things for some people, it wasn't neat after the first or second time, but they were landing the space shuttle at Edwards Air Force Base, the dry lake bed and I was there during that two years. So, so I got a patch for every mission because we were backup communications for NASA. And um, my- Did your family go with you to California or? Yeah, they did. They couldn't, um, they were with me. We met up in Florida. I had my second child in Florida and then we went to California. And then from California, we went to Japan. <laughs> and, um, you know, this was all, it was like every two years where I was moving, you know, and I only had um, 16 years in the military when they offered, well, actually 15. And I just, I made promotion to Master Sergeant, which is unusual. In my job, there had only been one other woman who had ever made rank above me in that job. And we, there were very few of us. And um, <clears throat> I, um, I kind of did myself in, in a way, because I was one of those people, don't tell me you can't. I don't say I can't. I go try it first, and then if I can't, I can't. But um, that's another reason why I left home. My father was an alcoholic, and he was telling me I couldn't do anything, and my mother would say I can't. So that's kind of helped put determination into me to prove myself. And um, I had issues of, there was a 400 pound decontamination unit. And they'd asked us to go do maintenance on it. Well, the guys were too busy doing a smoke break. I didn't smoke. So we, now hear me and my trainee, go and pick up that 400 pound unit and move it on. <laughs> if I could, I did. And I think it probably has done its damage on my body, you know, because now I have a lot of issues with uh, spinal deterioration and things like that. I had to have um, 
my neck fused in the back. They had to go in and fuse me in the back. I have deterioration of lower back. Just recently heard I'm going to have to have corporal tunnel and the other surgery, you know, four different surgeries. Mm -hmm. But it's all wear and tear, you know, and it's good to prove you're just as tough as the men, but you can carry it too far like I did, you know, which I I didn't know till years later. And so that's, you know, we're just not built the same as men are. So that's the one big drawback I have with the new military now, you know, women are women, men are men, you know, and we can do a lot, but there are limitations. And uh, so I have my own opinions about that. <laughs> but, you know, I'm just glad I'm not in anymore because I would... I would keep my cool when somebody get upset. I got a, I got a lot of compliments. I, you know, about being a good teacher. Yeah, you know, I was a squeaky mouse who never said a word in high school or college. You just barely passed speech. But I don't hesitate now to get up and give a speech if I know what I'm talking about. I'm. I don't have. I'll. I would do theater briefings, get ready for exercise. Here's how you put on your chemo gear, put on your gas mask, do this, do that, you know. And, um, you know, it really, it can do a lot for you, the military. It can give you confidence, but you've got to invest yourself in whatever it is. And so um, I got out of the military in Japan. It was... I appreciated all the training that I ever got. It's excellent place to learn and to do and to grow as a person. But the unfortunate thing when I left, I took the early out. I could have continued on and been the first chief master sergeant, uh, you know, in my job. But I uh, lo it lost its glow because. I wasn't allowed to um, supervise, which would uh, made me competitive for promotion, and I was being singled out and uh, kind of punished and picked on by my boss, and uh, you know he, you know he would harass and things like that, <clears throat> and uh, I uh, filed a discrimination situation, and they did not even investigate so they had to turn around and I made an inspector general report uh, against it and they found it to be valid but I didn't get my curtailment that I wanted from Japan where I could go start over um, you know I just had to stay and walk on eggshells afraid they were going to do something to my husband or my children so I went ahead and got out you know they were offered early out I had reduced retirement because of that, you know, instead of 50% at 20 years, I ended up with like 37% at 16. So, but it is what it is. And I still, um, I was very well known as either, you know, when they met me in person, they thought I was a very nice person. But when they, they heard rumors about me standing up to the, the big boys, you know, because I'd do that, you know, if somebody didn't do their job. I'd like to write them a letter of reprimand. I'd give them a lower evaluation. I don't pull no punches. I only ask them to do what I'm willing to do. And I got called a big B <laughs> before, you know, for, for standing my ground. And um, so. Was, was that true with most women when you were serving that, that they ran across those obstacles? Do you think? Most women would just get out. They got tired of fighting the battle. But my personality, I guess, you know, having a difficult home life, you know, I was, well, I'm not going to settle for less than. I'm not going to settle for less. You know, you, you got to fight. And not many people, um, from what I understand, the fight rather than flight personality, there's only 10% of the population that are that way, and I'm one of those. I'm, I'm nice and kind, but I'm also, don't back me into a corner because I'm a fight, not flight. You mentioned your husband went to um, Iraq. Yes, this was, um, we had, I had been out of the military, I got out in 94, and um, he had 
landed a job with the Army Corps engineers right at the tail end of my career. Uh, we had came back to the States and uh, he got a job with the civil service for the Army Corps engineers. Well, he worked with them for several years and he, he had an itch to go to Iraq because they were, he was an accountant for the Army Corps and he wanted to serve again. So he went over there for six months and I was back home. I was, um, I was doing a part-time job. I was a economic assistant for the Labor Bureau and Stati Statistics. And you drive around pricing things for the consumer price index. And that was pretty interesting. But uh, he wanted to go and stay longer in the civil, in the, over in Iraq. He was asked to stay over there because he was taking care of their accounting issues. And therefore, he went ahead and um, <clears throat> he called me. We called me on a regular basis. And of course, the hour changeover, it was like, you know, early morning for him, late night for him after he got off work, you know, that, for example. So, um, you know, he told me he wanted, they had asked him to stay. And I said, you know, not without me. You're not going to, because to keep a marriage together, you got to stay together. You know, and six months was long enough. And we had been separated several times before. I'm not voluntarily, but... Um, you know, he, he went ahead and talked to him and found me a position over there, administrative position. I would do the plane tickets for anybody doing emergency leave and coordinate all that stuff and, you know, their R&Rs and make sure all the paperwork was coordinated to pay for their plane tickets and what have you. You know, that was one of the jobs I did while I was over there. What was it like over there? It was all work and no play. <laughs> <laughs> you worked 65 hours a week and you know you didn't there was you know they'd let you off half a day on Friday to go shopping you know around the, and Camp oh, Victory okay. was really big and they had some what they called haji shops and you could go pick up some perfume bottles and you know some you know alabaster this or you know just little trinkets and things you could pick up but um, you know it w it was it was really a drama you know you it's like a small town too you know when you get over there because everybody's confined to a small compound and um, because of being ex-military some of those National Guard and reservists which was primarily what we were with over there they had no idea, <laughs> you know, they really didn't, you know, if they were hit, it was kind of a calmer time. And every now and then they'd lob over a bomb or something. They, they hit um, my husband's laundry facility uh, about two weeks after he left that, that portion of, you know, to come join me at where I was going to be at and serve together. But, um, you know, you never know. You know, and like over there in Iraq, um, we had um, Iraqis that came and worked with us. They would help the Americans out and they would invite them to come work on the post. And I struck up a friendship with one of them and she, um, she got her green card to come to the States because she had helped so much with the, you know, the Americans and learned English well enough. And... Uh, <clears throat> She went to Montana and she lost her job after six months. Well, she stayed in touch with me and came to live with me for about six months. And, um, you know, it was, you know, you're not allowed to witness to people, but you can be a witness by who you, who you are and who you, what you believe. And uh, so we were able to talk her into going to church with us and she would cry every time she'd go. And uh, her, her family was a big family name over in Iraq. And uh, she, um, she, she had a daughter and she was divorced. So she had been through a lot, but we helped her a lot get established. I helped her get her job at Walmart, you know, trying to help coach her and help her. And she got a manager's job with Walmart, helped her find an apartment, helped her find a babysitter. You know, so I did my part you know, 
to help. Then you said you also went to Afghanistan. Yes, this was uh, about, this 06 was when we went to Iraq. And then in 2011, we had um, moved from Dallas to Colleen, Texas. And then my husband had made a mistake, job mistake, because it was kind of a demotion, but he wanted a new adventure. Well, yeah, Iraq wasn't enough, and moving to Colleen wasn't enough. So we, he wanted to go to Afghanistan, so we both volunteered, and we ended up from 2011 to 12, and uh, we stayed, you know, it was the same thing, 65 hours a week. And, you know, it's just, you know, you get th threats every now and then, but it really the dangerous part were those people who didn't want to follow the rules and kind of run off the post when they weren't supposed to be. And, you know, that's a big no-no because, you know, you know, there was one guy who got killed by the Iraqis. They were supposed to be as guards and they ended up, you know, want money and, uh, you know, they, they killed the poor guy. He was from Orangeburg, South Carolina. And so, you know, it puts the fear in people like, and, you know, I took it ser more seriously maybe than the rest of them did because most of them were civilians in our compound contractors and other people, and they never really experienced anything. I never had hand-to-hand -hand combat, but I knew how to handle a weapon, and I knew what it was for. And when they had a little bit of training sessions going on, they showed us how, because we weren't allowed to carry weapons in Iraq or Afghanistan. But I knew, just like when I taught chemical warfare training in the military, you see extra equipment around and something's happening, you go grab that extra equipment and you use it, is it? you know, because it's no good for them. So you pick it up and you carry it and you use it. So if there's an AK-47, they, you know, they showed us how to, how to load it and fire it. And I, I sure would take it if something happened, you know. So, you know, you, it's a matter of... It's a matter of survival, you know, and that's what I taught, you know, in chemical warfare training. There was great interest during the Gulf War before we knew whether they had chemicals or not because the people at um, the stealth fighters and all that stuff, those people came in civilian clothes and I taught them class about, you know, the different chemicals and how to wear their gear. And it was ser taken seriously then. A lot of times people don't take things seriously until something happens. And, um, you know, that's, that's the big drawback. You know, people get complacent if nothing happens. And um, in, um, what's it? No, it was, it was, um, it wasn't Afghanistan. It was Iraq where one of my bosses just before I left, he got, they got the concussion from the bomb that hit nearby and he got thrown up against those concrete walls that they have, because they have a lot of them. And he was waiting in line to go in to eat his meal at the DFAC, they call it, dining facility. They, they hated it being called the chow hall because it's offensive. So the DFAC, you know, he's standing in line and he got thrown up against the wall and he had traumatic brain injury. So he never made it back over there, but so. Yeah. But, but you never went off of the base in Afghanistan or Iraq? Um, I did um, when I wanted to, get, before um, they actually, you know, when things weren't extremely tense in situations, I would, uh, I went off base to with my Iraqi friend to go to see the job site where she was supervising because she was an engineer. She had an engineering degree from the University of Baghdad and therefore she was working for the military and um, she showed me, you know, different buildings they were building and she took me to the museum, you know, that they had there. And of course it got, everything got ripped off, but, you know, all the trinkets and, and items, you know, of interest. But it was very interesting how it was built. The Tomb of the Unknown Soldier it was like on a pedestal with the flying saucer, and that's where they kept the tomb. That's where the tomb was of the Unknown Soldier. <laughs> it's the strangest thing you ever saw in your life. And then 
at the gates, they had his, uh, Sodom is saying they had his hands up like this, and then at the bottom they had the real skulls and concreted over on the ground all over the place. Just, you know, those type things I got to see, yeah, you know, because, of her. because I was able to go off the post with her and she was, you know, looking, actually looking at the job of the job site that what they were working on. Did you have to wear, cover your head? Well, when there were, um, we wore uniforms, not in Iraq, but in Afghanistan. We wore the uniform of the day, whatever it was. And then we um, were able to put on civilian clothes and we could go to another base, um, kind of a market, but it was controlled. So that was the Friday evening. We could go and shop and buy, you know, some rugs or, you know, send them home and things like that. That was in Afghanistan or jewelry or something like that. But uh, the main rule number one was over at Iraq and Afghanistan, the number one rule was no drinking. Because you get over there, you get isolated, you, you know, you. You know, fortunately, I was with my husband, but, you know, you get isolated and it, you know, it gets depressing. And uh, even when I was in Sicily um, on my remote assignment there, we've had people who who overdrank themselves so much that they, they, you know, they aspirated on their own vomit and nobody, everybody else was too drunk to even rescue the person. Yeah, you know, so, you know, it's serious business. Alcohol is, <laughs> it's terrible. It does, it does terrible things to people, you know, and it causes depression big time for people who are lonely. I think I know the answer to this, but I want to ask you. Would you have done anything different with your life as far as going into the military or not going into the military? Looking back. Looking back, know? I would have went into the military because it was a better choice than the dead end that I had in the, mm -hmm. the small town being nobody and being classified as you're never going to be anybody or anything. And, uh, yeah. you know, I was the attitude, well, you just watch me, <laughs> yeah. you know. And um, I would have joined anyway. I probably would have chose a different job because... If you're a woman and you go into a man's job and you succeed, that's why I got discriminated against in, in Japan. And there were people who supported me, men, because I primarily worked with nearly all men. Mm -hmm. And they supported me, but you have those few, just a mi minority of people, they're going to play their little games and they're going to hold you down if they can. And they do it in small towns. They do it in the military. They do it in business. It's just the way things are, you know. And I would have probably chosen a woman's job. And I, if I can excel at a job in a man's job, I know I can in a woman's job. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not into the games or anything else. You perform, you get promoted based on how you do your job, do it well, and, you know, you that's how you make it in the world you know that's how it's done that's true. well we sure do appreciate you coming and talking to us today i love having a woman veteran <laughs> <laughs> i love having all veterans but especially uh, the women that we have in lincoln county yeah. and we certainly appreciate your service well i appreciate the program you have here because you know very few people honor the military. I, I've heard a lot more over the past 10 years, people thanking me for my service, you know, but, you know, they don't really understand the sacrifices. It's really family they sacrifice. And, you know, families are origins and their spouses and their children play a big part in that too. Yeah. And um, I understand that tremendously. And I appreciate that you have some place for, you know, to honor those who are willing to sacrifice their lives and teach people, you know, our freedom is valuable and we need to protect it. Yes, we do. And I, I hope this country improves on that because I see some 
deficiencies right now. Thank you for your time. Thank you.